Good afternoon. I'm not sure where you are from, so I guess have a good day. It's better. <laughs> uh, I'm Anastasia and I will be your host, but we still have some time before to start, so let's wait patiently. And uh, remember to have during the presentation to have your microphones muted. Uh, so there will be a better uh, reception for you guys. Okay. Right now, I'm going to give my voice over to Andreas. Andreas, are you ready? I am ready, indeed. <laughs> so I hope that my uh, that the quick uh, and short presentation about what we do as a company was helpful for you. And now for the main event, Andreas, I'm giving the rest to you. Uh, your microphone is muted. So that's better now. Yes. Um, and I would like to share my screen. I am Andreas Grabitz. Um, please, if you uh, have any questions to me, just say Andy. I think it's easier for most of you than to pronounce Andreas. That's a bit complicated. I'm Andy. Um, I'm working for Eurofins um, since 2005. Um, so since uh, roughly 16 years now, um, I've been involved in different function within um, Eurofins. And since 2018, so around two years now, I'm I'm heading the Department of Packaging Materials in Hamburg, so I'm located in the northern part of Germany. Um, okay, that's it uh, with the food contact regulation. I'm promised already, last but not least, uh, I think very, very most of you dealing with the United States had already to do with California proposition. And therefore, I think it is worth a couple of more slides uh, to explain what the California proposition is. Um, the title of the California Propos proposition is, you see, Safe Drinking Water and Toxic Enforcement Act. This is not a packaging legislation. This is a legislation which protects the state's drink water sources from being contaminated from chemicals known to cause cancer or reproductive harms and requires business to inform Californians about exposures. So the idea of this, uh, of this law, of this uh, proposition, is uh, to limit the exposure of um, carcinogenic or reproductive chemicals to the people in California. And it is fully independent whether this chemical comes from a food packaging it is also covered, of course, but it can also come from a car or from, from a dustbin or from whatever. So the, uh, the idea is generally to, uh, to reduce harmful chemicals uh, to uh, the people of California. Um, the California proposition knows what they call safe harbor levels. Safe harbor levels are upper limits, let's say. Um, they have two different ones. One is for cancer-causing chemicals. Here they call it NSRL, no significant risk level. And for reproductive toxic chemicals, they call it models. Model is maximum allowable dose level. Don't care about these wordings. These are maximum uh, amounts of chemicals uh, for, uh, which are allowed, let's say. Um, actually, the... Uh, uh, this is again here the, the wording. Um, the, 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 meaning, the meaning of the California proposition is not that these substances are forbidden. This is not the idea. This is not the intention of California proposition. The intention is that if there is a chemical present in your material, you must apply a label a warning label. And the warning label says, this product can expose you to chemicals, including, and then you must give one name, which is or are known to the state of California to case cancer or birth defect. That is the only, the only issue. You need to have a label on it if there is a, uh, um, a cancer or birth defect substance in the material. Unfortunately, California proposition, uh, the, one of the consequences was that more or less 
total California is completely closed with warning signs. So this is what you can see here is one picture of one of my colleagues from the Disneyland Resort, um, a, a park, a Disneyland park um, in California, where they say, ooh, somewhere in our park, there is for sure a chemical which can cause cancer. We do not simply know, but we, we apply a warning label here. So that's indeed a bit ridiculous. Actually, the, one of the problem is that um, we have a lot, of, a lot of court cases in the United States, in California. Yeah. Um, where especially lawyers, uh, lawyers claim here we have a product uh, which has a problem with the California proposition. Um, you can see here on the right side, these are, um, is the amount, how many court cases we had. So um, the last figures I have are from 2017. And you can see here we have between six and 700 cases of California court cases. And the penalties were around 20 to 30 million US dollar. So really, really a lot of money. So I think it is really worth to check um, about the California proposition if you want to export into the United States. This is a list of these substances here. Uh, an extract of the list, of course. We have roughly 1,000 substances um, in the list. And for a lot of these substances, this is an ex extract of substances where I think they are of a certain relevance. You find here some PAH, you find bisphenol A, um, some phthalates, uh, methyl ethylstyrene. Here we have the styrene itself, vinyl chloride. Um, and for some of them, we have here limits. How much may be exposed to the consumers? These are, I would say, more or less uncritical. So very, very often we know that the exposure is rather low. But we have also several substances, like down here below, where we don't have any limit. This means for any, any at the, the smallest amount, you must apply a, a warning label on your packaging that this packaging may contain a substance uh, which is listed in the California proposition. That's really a huge challenge. But the good side is, if I go back to this slide here, um, these six to 700 court cases are mainly um, dealing with uh, three chemicals. The one is DEHP, a phthalate plasticizer, which is used very often in, um, in your computer cables. You know, these ones here, these soft cables. The insulation, this often contains uh, plasticizers. Um, this phthalate, if this is a phthalate plasticizer, um, then this cable must contain a warning label, according to California proposition. Um, this is the, the, the huge majority of court cases are according to DEHP. Uh, another uh, incident or another uh, large group of uh, court cases is due to bisphenol A, especially from polycarbonate bottles um, and um, the CD, uh, CD-ROMs. They are, are also made from polycarbonate, so they also need to contain a warning. So phthalates, bisphenol A, the last one is, this is crazy, this is interesting, this is wooden dust. So if this is a dust from wood, uh, which you can inhale, then it also can cause cancer. But all of the other chemicals, which you also can see here, which are typical paper products or which are polystyrene, PVC uh, ingredients, they have never, never seen a court case um, in the United States for, um, for the California proposition. Yeah, and this is a typical um, example of a declaration which we receive for California proposition. This becomes more and more common that uh, companies explain, yes, we have substances in it, um, and then we need to do a measurement, unfortunately. So that's uh, not really good news, because um, this is often very time consuming and expensive. Um, so th this is something which needs to be considered case by case. Yeah, that's it with my California proposition. And I think I'm quite well in time. It's uh, 2.30, at least here in Hamburg. Um, this is my contact team here. Here you see myself again um, and my team. And um, Natalia, I think we have a bit more of time. If there are questions, um, I'm more than happy to answer if possible. Of course, there are probably, I guess, there are questions. So let's hope for the people to 
now ask them. Let me moderate the questions. So don't be afraid, just ask. If there are too much people then uh, asking simultaneously, then I will tell which one will ask and we will have to maintain some kind of order. But nevertheless, please do. I hope you enjoyed this presentation as much as I did. It was very informative. So thank you very much, Andreas, for it. Thank you. I've learned a lot. And how are you people feel about this presentation? Do you have anything to ask? Don't be afraid. We are waiting for your feedback. We are waiting for your questions. Probably we had f roughly four hours of um, heart teaching now. <laughs> uh, yeah, I can imagine. I can imagine that uh, people are also tired and uh, need to re refresh and relax a bit. I can for sure offer. I will share uh, the presentations uh, from today with you, Anastasia. Mm -hmm. to share it with all, uh, all the participants, and of course, I'm also very happy uh, to answer questions if they arise later, if people are a bit refreshed and relaxed um, and think oh that was a point i would like to to discuss further more then we can do it also later on exactly even tomorrow morning as we are having the second day yes uh, there exactly. is no need to like rashly think about questions right now so uh, don't worry about it we welcome entire two days uh, for all of the, your questions or your your thoughts and everything and uh, yeah, so anyone? I, ha I have actually one uh, question. Please do. Uh, from Andrea. Uh, talking about the, both the regulations, uh, uh, FDA as well as European, uh, specifically for paper and board as well as plastics, what are the prim primarily the contradictory uh, standard citations that are different in FDA and uh, as compared to the European ones. So is there any difference between the two standards? And if yes, then what are the uh, areas where the difference lies? Yes, the, the, the whole idea of FDA and of, uh, of the EU um, is different. So the, what, the, uh, what the EU is commonly doing is they are talking about migration. So um, if a substance is present in a material, we analyze how much is migrating into the food. So what we are doing is we do overall migration, we do specific migration, we do migration of NIAS. So we always take from a material how much is transferred into the food. The FDA is going completely different. The FDA says, I have a chemical from which I know that there is concern for this chemical. And because I know there is a concern of this chemical, I limit the use of this, uh, of this compound. So as I showed you, there is for certain chemicals, the restriction that this substance might only be used for 0.1%. Uh, or something like that. So the whole idea is completely different. We here in Europe, and to be honest, I'm, I'm a friend of the US protocol. I like it much more than what we do here in Europe. The Americans say, we do it. The FDA is doing the assessment once, the beginning. And if the assessment is finished, we limit it in the, uh, in the legislation. And then everybody is fine. You don't need to test it anymore. The Europeans, they do the assessment, they check, is it toxic or not? And if they say, yes, it is toxic, then they enter a specific migration limit into the legislation. But every manufacturer needs to confirm the specific migration on its own. So we measure and measure and measure the same substance for any company. Okay, right. So we can say that FDA is more stringent than the European regulations. Because no. they eliminate the okay. okay. No, it is not more stringent. It is it is different, but okay. not more stringent. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Anyone else? 
Hi, Andre. This is uh, Sayyid Naveed from Obi Khan. Uh, my question is, can you hear me well? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my question is from the sustainability point of view and from the food safety point of view in terms of uh, supplier perspective, basically. So, for example, you mentioned these are the standard. We need to buy this kind of material. We need to arrange this kind of uh, you know, uh, supporting materials, whatever. My question is that the suppliers which, from which uh, we are getting our materials, how much they are uh, knowing these uh, standards and they are complying the standard because uh, for us, the main challenge is that if they are not complying, then we need to find alternatives. And so uh, my, my point is basically that, that how much is basically the key suppliers of all these uh, materials are uh, adhering to these requirements uh, uh, because most of uh, uh, key materials we procure from the European countries and uh, some from China. So uh, how these things are really being, uh, uh, you know, followed by them. So yeah. did you get my question? Uh, yeah, fully, fully. Um, you are fully right. That's a huge, huge problem um, that especially if you supply your materials from Far East, uh, China, Korea, Vietnam, wherever, um, a lot of these companies are not aware of the legislation. Um, and this is more... Um, if these uh, companies are smaller or medium-sized companies. So we know already that uh, large companies uh, also in, uh, in China, but uh, also in Saudi Arabia, where you have, for instance, Sabic, uh, a very, very large manufacturer in Saudi Arabia, um, they are well aware of the, uh, of the legal situation in, uh, in Europe, in the United States, also in China, Japan, wherever. Uh, but the smaller companies, they really have huge problems. We fully know this. Um, and to be honest, at the end, um, we very often can't finally uh, conclude um, the compliance with, these, uh, with such suppliers. That's really a problem, yes. So basically, I think it's more of uh, the the link to the country, basically, from uh, where these companies basically are operating. So if they don't push them, otherwise they will just continue like this because it's a matter of, you know, the cost as well. Yeah, Maybe yeah. If I'm buying, I have to be cost competitive. So, so if I would prefer to go to sustainable product uh, and uh, mostly uh, sustainable kind of products are expensive because of the nature of uh, ingredients. Yeah, and in fact, at the end, is uh, we all within the supply chain and with the laboratories, we must be a bit flexible. That's simply a point, yeah. Yeah, but one more question, sorry, just another question. is about uh, when these standards are being defined, uh, are we really, like, uh, whoever is working on the standardization scopes, uh, how they are making sure that like the companies don't suffer in terms of, you know, uh, following the standard because if uh, applying the standards in terms of uh, producing such kind of material or ingredient and supporting materials, uh, they would, they could make it, uh, that could be less costly for them so that they can easily apply the standards and uh, go with this kind of stuff. To be honest, uh, your your connection was interrupted for a minute. Um, I did only get your last sentence. Can you please repeat the question? Yeah, yeah. my question is that, like, when we are defining the standards at the global level, the standards are defined, how it is being made sure that the standards are not just defined, that this is the way things should be, rather we make sure that the people who have to follow the standard, they can really use the standard and this would not be very costly for them to follow the standards to make this kind of materials available in the market. I'm talking about the, again, supplier perspective. Um, yeah, see, to, to be honest, the, uh, the, the most powerful um, stakeholder is usually the customer. So if you, if you so for instance, if you supply your material to companies like Nestle, uh, you 
must comply with the uh, with the European legislation. They do not accept any deviation. Um, but if these are more smaller companies or even companies outside of the European Union, um, they often also do not know um, the legal requirements very well. And then it is sometimes even easier uh, to yeah to not completely do all of this stuff which we discussed today yeah but, but you will have to if i may add you have to also remember that the end customer if they are going to make you know to some legal court with some actions because of some kind of problems that it happened because of the packaging like it's going to end on the person who on, on the people who are selling the whole packaging, not the very various suppliers who do yeah. so. Yeah. So uh, you have to remember that because, uh, yeah, it's usually the problem of the packaging company, not the resources companies. Yeah. Yes. That's fully correct. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for your questions. Anyone else? So I guess that's probably it for today. Thank you, Andreas, yeah. one more we will, time. We will see us uh, tomorrow again. So if there are any further questions, we can also happily discuss them tomorrow. Yeah, exactly. So uh, thank you for your time today. I hope that it was very informative for you and you've learned something new. And let's continue tomorrow for more knowledge and as Andreas is a great expert like in, the, in his field, let's hear him some more. Thank you very much, you all, and Thank see you. you tomorrow. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Bye. Have a nice day.